Welcome to The Expanded Podcast with your host, Lacey Phillips. As a leading manifestation advisor with a process that's, well, radically different from the old New Age model, mine is rooted in psychology, neuroscience, and my energetic gifts. I created this podcast to help you expand your subconscious limiting beliefs about the potential of deserving the manifestations you are calling in. Therefore, you're tuning into this podcast series to show your subconscious that anything you desire is possible. And by pressing play, you've already started the process of manifesting it. If you enjoy this episode, please leave us our review, comment, and share it with your fellow manifester that's struggling or could really benefit from the information that you're about to learn. So we're kicking off this episode with another My Magnetic Story, where I share the community's manifestations. And I'm actually really, really excited to share this one. I'm really excited to share all, but this is from one of my very first clients that I worked with when I actually launched my sessions three years ago. So here it goes. You guys, the manifestation I've been working on for the last three years finally came through. I'm so excited. I manifested my own apartment. Back then, my list was a studio in Greenpoint for a thousand a month, I know, which is really unheard of if you don't live in Brooklyn, um, with lots of light and a great kitchen. But I manifested a one bedroom, lots of exclamation points, with great light, a great kitchen for 1600. But I know the landlords and they're going to let me babysit their kids. I've done this before for them to make up for the extra 600. So three to four nights a month. There we go. Now she has a one bedroom for $1,000. Okay, going back to her. So I don't have to budget for paying more and end up paying what I originally intended. I'm over the moon. I really started to work on my relationship with money and recently got a ping that if I made a big purchase, I was considering it would help me level up my relationship with money and create some magnetism. I had always had a lack relationship with money, but I had the funds, so I did it, and my place came through two weeks later. Yay! (laughs) So I actually know this manifestor really, really well. And um, just to give you insight, I don't ever intend that people should go into debt in order to feel wealthy enough, therefore they attract more money. That is that is superstition I like to demystify. So what she's speaking about here is that when we are trying to open up, when you're working through opulence and we're opening up new portals and we're jumping off of cliffs, one little thing we can notice if it's within our means and we have the money, that if we... We know if we're getting a ping to push the envelope financially a little bit, it communicates, especially if we've done all of the work in opulence to up-level our worth, it communicates to the, the universe that it's like, I know I deserve this, and I know you're going to meet me there. And to give you an example, hers was renting a car for a week when she flew out to California and had to do a trip, which is something she would have never done. But she was like, I have the money. I know if I do this, it'll level up and communicate that I'm ready for these bigger things in my life. So... Huge congratulations for anybody out there that's manifesting an apartment or a house. You'll cruise over to The Pathway, where you'll access all of the workshops starting at $24.99 a month for all of them. And you'll want to work through opulence and you'll want to work through the formula magnetism, all of which she's done and many before her. The trigger I want to talk and work through today is the trigger of needing to control everything in our lives. And a lot of old New Age manifestation rhetoric talks about control means contraction, but a lot of people don't know why. I mean, obviously, in the conscious mind, we understand that that means that we're not open and flowing and allowing things to come through. But actually, it goes down to a far deeper root energetic that when you're working through these workshops, you really want to look at this instead. The need to control is communicating that you don't feel worthy enough. And worthy is the underlying word here because it's something that really has to integrate. You don't feel worthy enough of 
security, really. You don't feel worthy enough that your life can be secure, safe, and steadfast. So the worth is what you're really wanting to work with there. It's not being contracted, which obviously the beautiful symptom that will come out of this is that you'll open up and flow. But the way that I would really prescribe working through this is doing the daily reprogramming exercise. Obviously, that's just a great way to start out that you can look at all the ways you're controlling right now with the specificity of when you're down there. Why don't I feel worthy? So for instance, if you notice that you're controlling, let's say your partner, you know, you're having control of your partner that day and micromanaging them or, you know, uh, nagging them. What's really going on below is you don't feel worthy of them showing up for you and you surrendering the control to just allow them. And so that's a perfect way to take it through the daily reprogramming exercise. You'll take it through those journal prompts and then you'll go into the hypnosis and you'll reprogram it. So that's one way you can chip away at it every day if you want. And also at the same time, you'll be reinforcing the new neural pathways of feeling safe, secure, and steadfast, which will ultimately open you up and flow. Another really deeper dive you can go, since you'll already be in the pathway and you'll have access to all of the workshops, I would recommend first starting with Reparent. I would go through Reparent with a very specific focus of why don't I feel worthy enough through every stage of my childhood? Why don't I feel worthy enough for security, safety, and steadfast, a steadfast life? So when you go through each of those stages, You'll just lightly have that as a focus and you'll rework through literally pre-utero all the way to 25 with different magnetic parents if you need than what you had. Mine change all the time when I work through it. it. You know, they've been many variations of different parents, but you'll want to take it through each phase. And then after that, a really good remedy is to continue the daily reprogramming exercise when you notice a trigger come up that you're controlling something. And then ultimately, I think the real goal is to get to a place where we can just be pretty present, right? Because if we're not controlling things, that's what starts to lead into presence. Um, that, therefore, if we feel worthy enough that our life is safe enough, steadfast enough, um, and secure enough, we don't really need to control much more. So this is all about worth. It's not about being contracted. The beautiful gift is that you open up that contraction after, but you really want to focus on the worth when you're dealing with this, and a lot will open up to you. This is, I like to say that this is the pivotal moment where manifestors start to just sit back and be who they are, and a lot of things flow into them. So it's a very specific form of magnetism when you reinforce this enough. So that's the beautiful thing to look forward to at the end of the journey of the work and doing it consistently until you feel like you don't really need to control much anymore. I think it's said like it was fun and then it was fun with problems and then it was problems and then it was problems with problems and it was that kind of thing. It was like whack-a-mole, you know, or as when I went to treatment, they said, oh, you were switching seats in the Titanic. That's what they call it. You know, in the end, the ship's going down. So once you get past the point of using exogenous sources to change your reality, then it behooves me to find ways within myself through my spirituality to change my perception of life. Negative thoughts are like enemy soldiers, and if you let them dig and entrench into the field, they're really hard to get to. I find that having, like again, a more zoomed out worldview makes me take all the little nuances of our societal problems a little less seriously. I don't feel as compelled to go save the world in that naive sense. It's more like, how can I bring light right now when I walk in 7-Eleven? Today's guest, Luke Story, I have had the pleasure of being on his podcast twice. So if you haven't listened to those episodes, you're definitely going to want to cruise over there and listen to those after this. The first one was just a generalization of my story and manifestations and tools and practices. And then the second one is totally, totally focused around money, where you get to see us outlined through his life, his blocks, what he needs to work on, a lot of mic drops on money in general. So I really highly recommend listening to that. That just came out last December. Now, Luke, if you don't know him, you absolutely will after this. He's incredible. His podcast is such a hit. I've had I think my very first friend that introduced me to it was Meredith Baird. And then I've gone on to receive 
every friend like sending me episodes after because he interviews all of the people that you guys love within the sphere of wellness and biohacking. I would deem him one of the leading biohackers right now that are on par with all of the big ones we all know about. So I'm really excited for you to expand, learn about Luke's past. So it's incredibly expansive if you come from addiction. It's incredibly expansive if you, it took you a while to really get into your purpose and your flow. Um, how to be an entrepreneur, how to start a podcast, how to biohack. I think many of you will enjoy this. So sit back and tune in. Welcome to the Expanded Podcast. We're here today with Luke's story. And if you haven't already checked out, I'm on his podcast twice. So go listen to those now because it's an incredible podcast. My friend Meredith Baird actually introduced me to your podcast officially, I think, year and a half ago. Really? And she was like, you're going to love this. You're going to love all of the guests. And I totally fell in love with it. So when you reached out to me, you were one of the few people's podcasts that I knew. And I was like, oh my God, yes, I absolutely, what an honor. That's so cool. And it, was it not your first one? The, the you first know, podcast? yours was my very first one. Yes. And then it was like an avalanche after that. It yeah. was like so That's many. Good. That's good. I like getting to people first. I've had the opportunity to do that a couple of times where someone creates content in a different space. They write, they do videos, something like that. Um, authors are obscure doctors or scientists and no one knows about them mm. outside of their field. And I'm like, oh yeah, there's this whole thing, podcasting, come on in. Oh, it's the best. I think it's, I, and it's the number one digested medium, I think now. Nowadays. Yeah, because you can multitask. Yeah. I listen to podcasts. I think I could honestly say, yeah, every single day I listen wow. to a podcast or a portion of one. Well, let's get yeah. into it. Yeah. Let's get right back to the beginning. Tell us let's about <laughs> Your cultural upbringing, which I know, but let's yeah. tell the listeners your background and your cultural I'm upbringing. I'm so excited to be here. I, um, I enjoyed our first two conversations and I love being able to talk more because when you're the host of a podcast, you know, I'm always struggling with, I'm like, have this inner voice, shut up, Luke, let the guest talk. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because yeah. my, my shows are more conversational anyway and it's just how I roll, but it's nice to be like, aha, okay, yeah, like, now. The mic is mine. Yeah, yeah, it's fun. There's, I mean, I'm 48. I've had a colorful life. I always say my hippie mom moved from Berkeley to Aspen, uh, married my cowboy dad. And that's how I've always kind of started the origin story. But recently I visited my mom up in uh, Sonoma County. And she was like, God, I hate when you call me a hippie. Like hippies are gross. Wow. She, well, my mom was like a mod. Yeah. You know, oh, really. So she but, was a beatnik. Yeah. And she was San Francisco 60s, you know, and she's like, oh, hippies like were on the street and, you know, did <laughs> like heroin. Having and were, sex with everyone. Yeah. yeah she yeah. was like, oh no, hippies were like dirty. I wasn't a hippie. Stop calling me that. And I was like, well, mom, you don't get it now in, in this generation. Like hippies are super cool. Mm -hmm. We look at Woodstock and we're like, Dude, your mom is at Woodstock. That's so cool. She's like, yeah, it wasn't really cool, you know. Um, so, yeah. So, mom was not. A, I called her a hippie because when I was a kid, there was like incense smoke and pot smoke in the air around the neighborhood, and um, the Eagles were always playing. And you know, it was just it was a very seventies kind of vibe. Floral dresses. I don't know. To me, she's a quasi hippie. Anyway, yeah, um, sounds like it to me. Yeah. So she um, and very you know very liberal, um, forward thinking. But she went to Colorado, fell in love with my dad in Aspen, who was a super rugged cowboy, ski patrolman, stock car racer, rodeo star, just a phenomenally um, textured man. And then they only lasted till I was about three. And then I moved back to California with my mom to the Bay Area where I grew up. And, uh, you know, we didn't have a lot of money. We lived in pretty, I mean, you know, it wasn't like Compton, but we lived in pretty downtrodden neighborhoods, low income mm -hmm. neighborhoods. And uh, my dad had money, but I, you know, I didn't live with him um, except on vacation and stuff like that. So I got to, you know, eat well when I went to visit my dad and my mom took care of me, but she was a waitress and, mm -hmm. you know, we didn't have money. So there was a lot of um, risk in the environment, you know, a lot of drugs and bikers and low riders, which is like pre-cholos, they used to be called low riders. Mm -hmm. They had longer hair with hair nets, you know, mm -hmm. the Latino gangbangers, you know. When I moved to LA, I was like, why do they all have shaved heads, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's a new thing. Um, and that was in the in the 90s. But yeah, so so when I was a kid, I just, I had, you know, had a very dysfunctional family and, uh, you know, there was a lot of drugs around the neighborhood. And in that culture, I think what kind of happened now in retrospect, looking back was, when the summer of love ended and Haight Ashbury kind of came to a screeching halt because hard drugs came in and all of that stuff, um, 
a lot of the hippies migrated north mm -hmm. and sort of just, you know, made these encampments and communities up there in those towns like Sebastopol and mm -hmm. Guerinville and Marin yeah. and all those places where I grew up. And um, so there was just, you know, there was a lot of like drug smuggling and just gnarly kind of dark energy up there. And as a sort of response to the lack of family, I guess, in a sense, and what was there was pretty dysfunctional. The response to me was going to survival mode and just get deeply into drugs, which I did when I was a, a kid, you know, in elementary school. And so thankfully I had that to save me, <laughs> totally, <yeah. laughs> which ultimately became my demise. But that was in lieu of, you know, going to a psychiatrist and getting help and getting on meds or having some kind of therapy. It was just like, wow, the adults are kind of checked out to mm -hmm. a degree. And so self-medicate. Yeah. And that's how I took care of myself. And then also when I was young, I discovered music, you know, and that was like my, I think my first spiritual experience really was listening to Jimi Hendrix and Black Sabbath and Led Zeppelin and just smoking weed and just going into these other realms and, um, you know, riding my bike around the country. And, you know, I had some fun, but there was also, you know, the childhood was punctuated with some traumatic experiences. So fast forward to 1989, uh, when I was 19, I moved to Hollywood so I was super into music and San Francisco was kind of the city that you moved to where I grew up when you were ready to flee. But San Francisco was so sleepy and boring and there wasn't really a great music scene at that time. So I came to LA and ended up, you know, meeting a bunch of my childhood rock and roll heroes and hanging out with them and doing drugs with them and just had a blast. Got a fake ID when I was 19. Mm -hmm. and so there I am living in Hollywood with my fake ID, playing in bands and doing copious amounts of drugs because I didn't have to be accountable to my parents and um, I didn't have to have a job because I could just sell drugs to support my habit. And I had a lot of fun, you know, I was a good looking kid and um, the older girls liked me, you know, yeah. <laughs> so I, had, I had all these older friends and that played in bands and stuff. I was like 19, 20, they were all like 30 and I had like these girls that sort of took me under their wing, would take me out to clubs and stuff. And, you know, I mean, it was just insanely fun. But at the same time, early 90s in Hollywood was pretty sketchy. Oh, yeah. I lived behind the Chinese theater. I can't was, even imagine. what Even what was Vine and Sunset like Yeah, then? that's like where I lived, you know, on Orange and Hollywood. And uh, there was a lot of crack in that area. And mm -hmm. heroin, not so much. You had to go to downtown LA, which was kind of a hassle. But I think I you still do. Probably, uh, mm -hmm. I eventually figured that out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> found my way uh, eventually, but yeah, you know, it's just it's one of those things where, and people that are no longer doing drugs and drinking like myself have a similar story. You know, I think it's said like it was fun, and then it was fun with problems, mm -hmm. and then it was problems, and then it was problems with problems, and it was that kind of thing. But what had started out as a really fun, innocent, I'm going to move to Hollywood and be a rock star and do tons of drugs and be free ended up being really imprisoned within addiction and just a lot of really depraved situations that I put myself in and just like oh even now certain streets I drive by I just go like oh, oh god bet. like the memories are just imprinted just dark times of just degradation and just the lowest of self-worth you know just absolutely is it, even like when you're in a really low place like that at least for me there was still this small voice that was kind of going you're better than yeah, this. Yeah, you have there's more meant for you than Yeah, this. you yeah. know, cuz I'd gone to this sort of reform school, uh, boarding school when I was 14 for 2 years in Idaho. It was kind of this cult weird sort of brainwashing self-help est kind of I don't even know how to describe it. It was fucking bizarre. Mm -hmm. But in there I got some sense of who I was and some sense of truth and salvation and I sobered up for 2 years from 14 to 16 and I didn't, you know, I stopped oh. committing crimes and I was, you know, before that I was having all these problems with police and they were going to send me away to um, kids prison for a long time and all this stuff. So I got out of there and I had a sense of who I was mm -hmm. and I just didn't realize that I was already a full-blown drug addict. So from like 16 years old to 19, moving to Hollywood, I had started to dabble and mm -hmm. all of that stuff. And then it got super, super dark and um, still realized that, oh God, I'm not supposed to be doing this. I didn't know what I was supposed to be doing, but I knew it wasn't that. What you know? was your come to moment where you realized, like, I really, I'm, I have more meant for me than this, or your spiritual experience that made you go and get sober? There was, th there were two actually. Um, <laughs> there were a bunch of them. <laughs> I'll give you the the main ones. There was kind of a long drawn out period from maybe ninety three to ninety seven where the hard drugs started to really take over and. 
I would try and quit one of them and then it was like whack-a-mole, you know, or as when I went to treatment, they yeah, said, oh, yeah. you were switching seats in the Titanic. That's mm-hmm. what they call it. You know, in the end, the ship's going down. You yeah. Know, that yeah. Kind of thing. Doesn't but, matter which one you want to do. Yeah. But that was, you know, that worried. was, that was actually really scary because I thought that I'd have something beat. I would get off heroin and be like, okay, cool. I'm never doing that again. That was a nightmare. And mm-hmm. then I'm like, you know what? I'll just smoke crack. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, yeah. this was the logic that I had. And so there was a long period of that, of just like, God, just getting defeated over and over again, trying to quit, trying to quit, trying to quit. And I just couldn't, or to moderate. And just like, my dream was always to just smoke weed. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's like, I want, I would fine with quitting drinking and quitting hard drugs, but God, I've got to smoke yeah, weed. Yeah. <laughs> and so there was a battle for a few years of trying to like wrestle myself, you know, my, my willpower into allowing that to happen because that medicine was actually pretty good for me. I mean, mm. I was not very productive and forgot to pay bills a lot and stuff, but I wasn't terribly destructive when I just smoked weed. It was the other drugs that got me to just be in really sordid places with dark people and just, you know, super bad news. So there was that kind of long period and that progressed and progressed to where it got to be like, oh my God, I can't make it a day without all of this stuff. And then in the end, I'm just doing everything all at once, all the time, Mm 24-7. And that started to feel like, I just felt like I was a slave. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, that's mm-hmm. what, because yeah, when I you be- didn't own yourself anymore. Yeah, when I became free, I didn't even know what it felt like to be free, which is the next story I'll get to. But I didn't know what it was like to be free. And once I was free, I was like, holy shit, I was enslaved. I really was. I was just completely under the spell of some little powder or pill or mm-hmm. something, you know, that I'm, my whole life revolves around like a $20 piece of fucking garbage. Yeah. You know, from yeah. some field in Mexico. You know what I mean? It's Absolutely. just like, wow, this is the sum total of my life at 24, 25, 26. So there was a couple pivotal moments where I had an awakening. And it's funny because I didn't remember this first one for a long, long time, but it was actually a psychedelic experience. Now, I was trying to just get high and party. Mm-hmm. I used to sell mushrooms. Mm-hmm. I I didn't realize they were also like in the same class as cocaine and heroin mm-hmm, and stuff. So mm-hmm. I could have gone to prison. I didn't know that. I was like, what? Shrooms? No big deal. It's yeah. like weed. It's like weed. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, 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 like yeah. Schedule one. You thought it was schedule a one. misdemeanor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, yeah. yeah. I, would, I would never sell hard drugs because I was super paranoid of going to prison. So I just sold weed. And then I sold mushrooms for a long time. And someone's like, dude, that's schedule one. If you get caught with five pounds of mushrooms, you're going to prison. So I ate a bunch of mushrooms one night um, in this apartment building where I live called Disgrace Land. And... Uh, <laughs> the irony. Yeah. Wow. It's it's been torn down, which I was so happy about. One day I drove by and it was a parking lot. Like, what, when, like what's when the they energy redid there? The, when they redid the Chinese theater and did yeah. all that and made it nicer, I was like, oh, my, thank God that building is gone because yeah. I have so many horrific memories. But anyway, I'm on shrooms and I was talking to my buddy, um, Repo, this guy from Finland, and uh, we played in a band together. And he was like wanting to party and get drunk and smoke weed and just be on mushrooms. And I started having a goddamn meltdown. And I just, I remember saying to him, I was like, dude, I can't do this anymore. Mm. I got to stop. I can't do this. Like I'm, there's something else I'm supposed to be doing. And I was just crying and crying and crying. And then, you know, of course, woke up the next day and was like, okay, where's the drugs? That was a nightmare, you Mm -hmm. know? And um, so shortly after that, that was the first little awakening where I started, man, I'm getting close. It's like when you watch a cartoon and there's, the characters are in a little boat going down a river and they're about to go over the big waterfall. Mm-hmm. It was that kind of thing. And I got the sense like, oh shit, the waterfall is really close. What was the waterfall for you? Getting physically injured, like out on the street. Mm-hmm. I had a few close calls where like, I was just blessed to not be hurt. Mm-hmm. you know. And then get in trouble with the law. Mm-hmm. I think one of my biggest values is freedom. Mm-hmm. You know, it's something I've always really fought for in, in many regards. So the idea of prison is just the ultimate antithesis of, of one thing that I really value more than anything, which is just the freedom to move about the world. And mm-hmm. so I was really afraid of going to prison and I was starting to get... Um, a lot more sloppy. I was pretty clever at avoiding the police. I wasn't like America's dumbest criminals. Like mm-hmm. I used to have friends who would go downtown and buy heroin and they would sit and do it in the car right on the corner They're where me. they got it. And I'm yeah. like, you dumbasses, mm-hmm. even if you're sick, you got to make it back home, mm-hmm. you know, and have it like in your mouth so you can swallow it if you get pulled over. I mean, there's all these protocols mm-hmm. that dope fiends develop. Yeah. yeah. And some of them are fucking dumb. And so I wasn't that dumb, mm-hmm. but I was starting to get that way because I be- was becoming so desperate Reckless, and just like mentally yeah. deranged and all of that, just kind of mental illness started to set in. 
<laughs> it's funny being so graphic with these stories, but whatever. I, it's I, great some, for the person I who's out there struggling. You know who's, right. who you're probably one of the biggest expanders for is my mom, really? who's like still heavily, really suffering with addiction. In oh, fact, man. she had a rock bottom happen this last holiday, and I think she's going to go to Betty Ford on the 1st of February. Oh, God, I hope so. Me too. So wow. it's actually really expansive for somebody out there. Well, like, you know, it makes me it's, emotional. It took me a long time, actually, to talk about things this candidly because I've had a lot of shame around it. It's like... You know, Everybody there's does. one side of it is like it's sort of um, sensational. You could be like, "Well, I'm fucking badass. Like, look at this cool stuff I've been through. I'm a survivor." I've been there. Yeah. yeah. So there's you know there's like maybe a little ego um, fodder in that that you have you know a rich history that's sensational in that way. But for me, it was like I hesitated talking about things in this much detail because it was just like God, I felt like kind of a loser. You know, I had so much shame for all of those years to finally come out to people like outside of the realm of my inner circle in recovery and stuff. But then, as I started to do it, I would like drip out a little more information, and then I get feedback from oh, people, yeah. and I get DMs all the time from people like, "Oh my God, I'm sober two years. You're such an inspiration." Oh, and- I love that. Yeah, and so that that's why I'm just kind of like, you know, whatever, man. It's like I'm it's not my life anymore and um perhaps if someone hears that and they're like, "Oh my god, I'm the one that shoots up at the spot downtown yeah, still." Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, totally. I'm that dumbass. I just got out of jail, you know, um yeah. to know that there's a way out and there's such a I mean, god, you want to talk about a different universe that I live in now. I mean, it's like I Oh yeah. It's just Yeah, it's from like vampire land. I, yeah, I have a just, yeah. you know, we can get into that, but my whole soul experience on the planet is just I literally live in a different universe mm-hmm. than I used to you know it is so actually ways. such a um such a depiction of vibration like truly like yeah. the the unseen of energy and frequency and vibration you're somebody who has lived at the spectrums of it and throughout so it, it really is so true that you live in a totally different universe attracting completely different things right versus that point but continue hmm, that's interesting yeah that's interesting I think, you know, now at this point in my life, the thing that's fun about it to be able to kind of dip into this and go back there, you know, to tell the story is there's so much contrast. You know, I feel like, God, I've lived a lot for someone my age. There's Mm -hmm. so many different sort of... If only you were a writer. (laughs) Yeah, right. (laughs) You're a biohacker, but if only you were a writer. Well, you know, it's funny, actually... um, uh, Durek introduced me to his book agent uh, oh, recently. Good. Yeah, and I was like pitching her a couple ideas. She's actually the life story. I was like, I don't know if anyone would be interested in this, but here's a couple of the touch points. And she was like, Dude, that's an amazing story. You, that's your book. You know, I was yes. like, okay. I just feel like there's a bunch of like, you know, I survived drug addiction books. So, but I guess each story is unique. So, anyway, what happened was um, there was two major turning points. One was I had. You know, specifically with the opiates, I had really, really struggled to stay off of them. And every time I would quit, I would do kind of what I called a train spotting kick. And that's where you like pay someone to lock you up somewhere where you don't have access to a vehicle and you can't get, you know, it's like drug buddy rehab, you know, Mm -hmm. like I would be with someone who was a drug addict. They're still doing it, but they wouldn't give me any, you know. Yeah. And so I did one of those and it was like in oh god like some really heinous hot part of the valley tarzana or something like that yeah in this really scummy apartment in my drug buddy's house and uh yeah i was rolling around on the floor there There there's no bed just on a gross carpet just kicking taking copious amounts of pills that were not opiates but that would like knock you out drinking alcohol anything i could do to just like be super loaded to not notice the withdrawal of the heroin yeah it's funny because Byron Katie, who's like one of my favorite teachers, she has a similar story where she woke up and came to and there was like cockroaches crawling on her. And that was what <laughs> happened for me. They weren't on me though. They were just around me. Yep. And I was like so weak. I couldn't really get them out of the way. And I'm sort of half conscious just going like, wow, this is my life. I'm on a dirty goddamn carpet in Tarzana. And I'm down here with the roaches. Like we're in the same space here. Mm-hmm. You know Completely. what I mean? Sharing space with cockroaches in yeah. the valley. And um, yeah, that was the moment of surrender. And I got on the phone with my mom. And, um... Oh man! I look at my cry too. <laughs> so it's okay. You know, it's so funny. It's it's you know, it's 22 years ago that that happened. But it's like. I still just have such a visceral memory of what that was like because it's like I've been fighting most of my life and I've just been fighting and fighting and surviving and surviving and I just wouldn't relinquish control, you know, and that was the moment where I was like, I am spent. Like I literally have no answers left because 
you know, I had no money. I, I knew that I was going to come back to Hollywood and I was going to get $20 together and I was going to get well. And then I'd be right back there again, but I literally had nothing. And then the next thing is, you know, you get robbed, you get arrested, you lose your apartment, you become homeless, you become a street person. And I was like right on the verge of that, Absolutely. you know? And so that little voice that I was saying was like, no, there's, you just, you've got to do it. And so, yeah, I called my mom, God bless her. And she had the wherewithal um, to get me into a rehab. And so wonderful. Yeah, two days later, I'm on a plane from LA to San Francisco, just getting shit faced, like pounding tequila the whole time. You're like, is it sort of that? Like I'm going to binge before I oh, go on. Oh God. Yeah. Leaving Las Vegas, man. <laughs> totally. Yeah. I made it to the San Francisco airport drinking on the hour flight, just like chugging whatever I could. And then in the San Francisco airport, I went to the bar and I kept drinking and I almost missed my flight to Santa Rosa, got off the plane there. And um, yeah, it's funny. My mom, I thought I was going to go to my mom's and like party for a few days. I had this idea. She's like, okay, cool. Yeah. Great to see you. Let's go. You're checking in tonight. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. (laughs) No, not tonight. I'm like in a few days, you know? So I sat in the Santa Rosa airport and, uh, and got really shit faced, and um, yeah, I kept drinking all the way out to the rehab out in the woods, and had my last drink, and my last like I was like hyperventilating, big spliffs in the parking lot, and I knew that was the last one. You did inside your body. Oh, it was yeah, that was wow. it. It was my last. I knew it was my last drink. Wow. Yeah, in that parking lot, some really good beer, some microbrew beer. <laughs> <laughs> at that state, well, I'm really, I'm I, actually like. Well, I had inspired. her stop at the liquor store on the way there, and okay. I was like, I'm not going to have my last drink be, you know, Milwaukee's best or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, like, a know, forty. So got, or yeah, something. so I got some really you know, King Cobra forty. I got some great beer, and I just pounded and pounded, and then checked myself in, and um, and the next, you know, real pivot point there was that. I understood by that point that I couldn't help myself. And I also understood, I mean, I'd been to a couple 12 step meetings and I was aware that that's where you kind of go, but I was not very interested in that route. I don't think anybody is that I've ever met. Um, I, I like, (laughs) and cause I'm obviously surrounded by so many people in recovery and addiction in my family, but I've even my mom just went to a meeting a week ago, and she's like, "Of course, the I sit down to the homeless guy that's like starts yelling out and freaking out, right, and it's a right. very small town, so there's nobody that inspires." And I've never yeah. met somebody who's like, "Oh, I'm so stoked to do people, AA." Yeah, people don't go to twelve step meetings because their life is on point. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Although I've known a few in LA because really? there's a scene. Oh, you know? okay, right, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. 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 Like, Continue. Yeah, but this is really, I, I think, the single most profound moment of my life was coming to uh, February fifteenth, nineteen ninety six. Seven, uh, in that rehab mm-hmm. and going to the nurse or you know the counselor and being like uh, I'm super sick like you guys got to give me something can, you, can I get a shot of something and they took my vitals and they're like no you're good we don't have we got nothing for you <laughs> you know it's like okay what am I supposed to do I'm freaking out and uh, they said well you get on your knees and you pray to God yeah you know, and I was like, uh, what? No, you got some Demerol prayer? <laughs> you know, it's like, are you serious? So even though I kind of knew that was coming, I thought it was going to be an easier sort of transition and I'd have some help there with the physical part of it. And, um, and I didn't. And I'm so grateful because I literally had no choice but mm-hmm. to just ask whatever God was, which I was not really raised with any religion or anything like that. I think I was probably a bit more... Mm, interested in the Eastern path and it, you know, picked up a couple books on meditation and, you know, Vedic philosophy and things like that. Some of my family had been going to India and having pretty profound spiritual experiences. So, you know, I had an idea that I could approach spirituality from that place, but I had definitely never prayed before. Mm -hmm. And, um, what was that like your first time? You know, I mean, I was so out of it. I don't remember exactly. I just remember, kind of just to get the mechanics of it physically. Like I'm like, okay, I think you put your hands together and then Completely. you get like at the foot of the bed. And I think, you know, it's just like, how do they do it on Little House in the Prairie yeah, or something? Yeah, you know, I was yeah. like thinking of movies, like pray. Okay, so you do this. And yeah, and my prayer was just like, I think they gave me the words probably because it's not words that I would have come up with, but just God, please remove this obsession. Mm. You know, just, I want to be free. Just God, just make me sober or whatever, whatever the words were. But I think um, really why it worked is I was just completely humbled and I had just completely surrendered and I was totally out of answers. And that's the, 
that's the sweet spot where source can really get in and do its work. You know, when it's, there's no more control. Yeah, it's yeah. that you know, it's we have we're given this amazing gift of free will, and if you want to go be a pedophile serial killer, go nuts. Mm-hmm. No one's going to stop you. Mm-hmm. I mean, you well, know, God's not. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> God's not going to stop you. In right, other words, right, you know, we right. have the spectrum from the the lowest of low energies to the highest of yeah. the angelic, and mm-hmm. you can play around within that realm here on this plane. Yeah, the physical plane. Yeah, and so I was allowed to do whatever I wanted, and I did, but when it hurt enough, you know, it's the great thing about this loving God that I experience in my life. It's like I didn't have to do anything to earn the grace. Mm -hmm. I just had to be humble enough to say, okay, I I realize that you've given me this will and I've used it. I'm now handing it back to you. Mm -hmm. I'm good. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Exactly, yeah. I am so done and I will do everything anything I have to do uh, in order to maintain, you know, sobriety. And and then in that moment, I was set free, you know, it's just from that moment until this moment now, I've never, ever once remotely considered doing drugs or drinking. I've never had a craving or compulsion that was strong enough to get me in motion toward it at all. I mean, Mm. sure, you know, the odd fantasy Mm -hmm. or I'm sure when I was new, I was so uncomfortable. I was like, God, I wish I could just have a drink. Something, yeah. I would drink near beers and shit, you know, sometimes, but I never was compelled like I used to be. I was set free. And Mm so the past 22 years has really been about, you know, really just expanding that phenomena into other areas Mm -hmm. of my life, you know, into finance, like we've talked Mm -hmm. about, and into sexuality and relationships and into unraveling other traumas that were sort of revealed later that I didn't even. Yeah, that I didn't even know had affected me, you know, and so it's now more about allowing that surrender experience and allowing myself to be guided in all areas of my life. And and I've had to cling to some of those and really hit bottoms in other areas too, where I become willing, like you and I have talked. It's where the magic, I mean, the magic happens. Yeah. What would you say your biggest rock bottom was? Was it during that time? I mean, I don't think it gets much worse than the cockroaches in, yeah, in Tarzana or Reseda. Or yeah. I mean, that's. I don't know if it's the valley the, that's worse. I'm yeah, not sure. Yeah. Right? No offense to anyone living no, no, in, the, in the valley, the but valley. Um, but you know, in 1997 and whenever that was, yeah, January, super depressing. Oh There's my like God. porn being shot in the next. Yeah, year, yeah, right? totally, <laughs> totally, the porn temple of the world. You know, I think that was really, I mean, it was those years were just a long drawn out bottom, but that moment was the moment that was just like, yeah, no, I'm, this can't, this can't go on. Um, but there's been a lot of them, you know, mm-hmm. there's, there's been a few, you know, there's been moments with money and, um, and debt and just not being in control of that area of my life. There's been moments of relationships that were painful and not healthy. Um, so I think in all the different areas of life, there's been, for me at least, I have to get pretty uncomfortable before, again, I'm willing to really surrender that part of my life. Mm-hmm. Like if you come to me and say, hey, Luke, you know, this is how you should relate romantically and this mm-hmm. is how you should approach your sexuality, I'd be like, I'm having fun, do it at my yeah, way. Yeah, 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 I've got yeah. this shit figured out, is, which mm-hmm. is what I thought through you know, my 30s, I would say. And, um, you know, and then at a certain point finding either that's becoming dissatisfactory or painful or just unfulfilling or Mm -hmm. empty and then going like, huh, well, again, here I am out of answers and then start to explore wisdom in those different areas and then start to actually invite a higher power into all areas of my life, which is where I am now. And it's so interesting, you know, going back to what I was saying about things are so different. It's like, now my entire life has been surrendered. Mm-hmm. You know, in not, all areas. Yeah, because I even got yeah. to watch you in the relationship field. I'm watching yeah. you in the financial field. Like I've seen you even, yeah. and you really are like surrendering to all of those, and magic's happening out of them. Oh, it's insane. I mean, that's the thing. You know, it's so funny about the human will and about the ego. Is it's totally. the ego is so funny. It's like it's like watching my dog. You know, I always look at animals, and you can see ego. It's like they think they're so clever. Mm-hmm. And you're going like, I know what you're doing right now. <laughs> you know, yeah. that's the ego like thinks, yeah. oh no, I got, I've got this all figured out. I know mm-hmm. what I'm doing. You know, it's like, no, you don't know what you're doing. You're serving the lower self. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I have surrendered that. And what's so funny about it is all the, the ways and, you know, just say like love and romance. Okay. All the ways in which my ego and my psyche tried to protect me so that I wouldn't get hurt yes. actually ended up hurting me more than getting hurt Always. and becoming vulnerable, you know? And yeah. so now... You know, exploring a new relationship as I am uh, for the past three months, which I'm so excited. I am too. I'm glad that we can talk about it a little. Oh, I'm fucking thrilled. Yeah, and what I'm experiencing is 
just surrender after surrender after surrender, and then I become afraid, and I just I'm not going to succumb to the fear. I'm just I'm mustering up every ounce of courage I have to just Amazing. go in fully and just be 100 percent vulnerable. You know, I mean, it really feel even just physically, I feel the vulnerability. Just mm-hmm. like God, just stick the fucking knife the in. The you know, it's just Oof, like yes. just get it over with. It's because it started to become so painful to withhold that experience from myself and from others. It's so um, interesting to me too. I mean, I think everybody has a form of addiction they've had to overcome in their life. May it be sugar to negative self-talk to, you know, whether it's substance. I mean, there's just such a spectrum of it. But what's so interesting, a lot, obviously I believe that addiction occurs for a couple of reasons. It's like unhealed trauma that needs to be addressed. We're trying to protect ourselves from things. But essentially what it does end up becoming is a form of living on the edge when it's out of control, right? But the ultimate point of living on the edge is that full surrender. There's nothing higher and scarier and crazier oh and you're, deeper than that. <laughs> you're not kidding. Yeah, you're not kidding. I just I just went on a trip uh, for a few days out of town. And yeah, I experienced, you know, in the romantic sense of, of vulnerability and just taking a risk. You know, it really is like front seat on a roller coaster kind of feeling inside and I'm just like no hang on don't let go don't let go don't let go <laughs> don't close mm-hmm. don't close you know because that's what um that's what fear does that's mm-hmm. what ego does but it's just it's actually just not intelligent you know that's Completely. the thing like I'm saying that the cleverness of the ego and all the games it plays to hide and you know obscure reality or project um, and all the things yeah it just doesn't it just actually limbic. just doesn't work yeah it, it's doesn't it doesn't achieve the desired result of the soul it gets in the way so exactly. it's like while while the ego is its intentions are good it's just not very effective mm-hmm. you know and so yeah even just just in the past week i mean i've had incredible surrender experiences just going like nope i'm not Ooh, giving into this so shit. much magnetism i can guarantee yeah. is on its way because of that yeah oh, and you know it. and you know what's funny is also just surrendering my will in terms of just timing too uh, you know having taken such a long break from dating and all of that and just going like Mm-mm, i'm done on i'm done doing it on my schedule and then there'd be fears there. Yeah, but you're getting older. What's that gray hair? And you know, whatever. Completely. You know? And it's just like, no, I don't care. I, if I'm 80 when I come out of this shit, and then I try to date, that's it. Is what it is. You know? but, and it'll be deep. <clears throat> yeah, but at a year, at a year and a half, it was like, okay, cool. No, I feel I trust a source. I trust that relationship. I trust the guidance, and more than anything, I trust myself. But and you're so, ready. Yeah. yeah, and it's it's just been so amazing because my initial experience now which is you know still new and limited it's just been so expansive and beautiful and it's so much better than anything i could have come up with intellectually had i like self-willed it you know so i'm sort of just watching god's handiwork going like really this is what i get for you know i want to say being a good boy but it's it's not the right way to state it but it's like this is what i get for surrendering and Mm -hmm. stop trying to control fucking everything and Mm -hmm. protect myself and and also what i get for accepting a little bit of prudence and discernment in Mm -hmm. the ways in which I enter into relationship and the people that I choose to enter into those with, you Mm -hmm. know? So yeah, it's just, it's, it's a really magical experience that I'm having right now because, um, as I said, just so many different areas of my being have just been like put on the table and I'm allowing so much to be released. It's fun to observe as myself going like, wow, let's see how this sort of personality can be relinquished and surrendered and see what comes to replace it. And what it's comes, almost like it's insane to watch. Yeah. It's, actually. I think it's the ultimate high cause it's the true self discovery. It's un, and also you're doing it through another, which I think doing it together in partnership is what speeds up. It can just speed up spirituality deeply. It's so profound. It sure you know? seems that way. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You guys are only three months, so this is exciting. I'm yeah, so excited for you both. Yeah, it's a, it's a wild and ride. And Cookie. Yeah. yeah. Um, I do want to ask you the question, because you are serving as such an expander for overcoming you know, addiction and recovery, and now all the other facets of your life that you've also been kind of approaching in the same way. You know, you've mm-hmm. rock-bottomed, you've surrendered. What have been for you the biggest tools that have brought you to this state of being so like the person who's sitting there listening they're in their rock bottom what would be because you're the ultimate biohacker like spiritual seeker when it comes to food everything if you were to kind of come up with the 10 things that have been the most profound since you've tried most of them what would those be well for me the experience of just getting sober initially was all about 
aligning myself with spiritual principles that were present within the 12 steps. And, you know, in the very beginning, it was like, cool, just get physically sober and then act like a goddamn maniac and do whatever you want, which Mm -hmm. is prevalent uh, to some degree in some circles of recovery it's like who cares what you do as long you sober yeah Mm -hmm. you're good Mm -hmm. you know you got in a fight today in traffic with some guy and road raged and got arrested cool did you drink Mm -hmm. you didn't drink oh you're cool you know i mean that's kind of like you can do that how many hookers did you bang last Mm -hmm. year you didn't drink though right you know so it's sort of anything goes so there was anything goes period which is like hey I'm cool. I'm, you know, <laughs> I'm not on drugs, so therefore I can do whatever I want and still lived in a lot of self will and a lot of insanity. And there's just, you know, the repercussions of that much emotional and, and psychic damage and just mental, like f- physiologically, the damage you do when you're using mm-hmm. certain drugs and stuff. Um, so in the beginning, it was like, cool, just stay sober and just hang on to recovery and the community in recovery and, um, and all of that. And then after a few years of that and life still being really unmanageable and still like looking from the outside like a drug addict, mm-hmm. you know, it's what they call a dry drunk mm-hmm. or a fire hazard, as I referred to myself for a mm-hmm. period. You're so dry. You're just like irritable yeah, and yeah. crazy and just fucking nuts, you know? And you're like, are you really sober? Well, no, there's emotional sobriety, yeah, yeah, you know? physical yeah. sobriety and emotional and sobriety. And spiritual sobriety. Yeah. And financial and sexual and all those things. But to give people resources, I mean, I mean, I don't know of anywhere else really in the world where there's such a wholesale experience of effectiveness in terms of recovery than within the 12 steps. And it's something that I talk about sort of cautiously because you have the principles of anonymity within 12-step programs and, Mm -hmm. you know, it's just... It's like if you're a movie star, right? Mm-hmm. And you're like, oh, I'm so, you know, you're a total fuck up. You're Robert Downey Jr., whatever. You're like, oh, now I'm in AA, mm-hmm. right? That's mm-hmm. just breaking a tradition mm-hmm. within AA. Yeah. And then someone's like, oh, cool. Wow, AA must work. And then that guy relapses and ends up back in court. You're like, that discredits AA. Mm-hmm. Or if someone, you know, misbehaves in other areas of their life or, you know, is just a jerk, then that sort of tarnishes the name of AA or whatever 12 mm-hmm. step group. So, you know, it's weird to sort of talk about and I've had to just find ways to dance around it. But within the traditions, I can just say like right now, if you're listening to this and you're struggling with an addiction, find a 12 step group that fits Mm -hmm. your addiction, just Mm -hmm. period. That's the only thing I've ever seen work in a large scale way. Mm -hmm. And if you look at, actually, if you really zoom out on recorded human history, the 12 step movement that started in 1939 um, is the only thing that's really ever worked Mm -hmm. in a longstanding way. There's, Mm -hmm. you know, there are these micro communities. Yeah. And and like white light experiences people have. I mean, I know of a musician who um, was a heroin addict for a long time and, uh, one day he was in his room sick and Jesus came in his room and manifested and told him to stop doing drugs and he did and he never went back. And yeah. now he goes to like the mega church in Orange County and he's very happy and has a family and he's sober. Mm-hmm. That's very rare though, that people are able to find it through therapy, through church, religion. It happens, mm-hmm. but it's just very rare where I find most of the people that have hit a significant bottom and really... Um, avail themselves to a 12 step, not just the meetings, but the way of life and actually integrating the principles is pretty much foolproof Mm -hmm. to me. Um, So I think the physical sobriety part is, is the beginning, but then where a lot of people miss the boat in recovery is the emotional sobriety and understanding of getting to the root causes of why you drink. I believe that. And even people percent. outside of AA think, oh yeah, that's those like weird groups in the church basement where people go to quit drinking. But that's not what it is. To me, the 12 steps are about learning how to live by spiritual principles so that you're fulfilled and on purpose And when you're fulfilled and on purpose, you don't have a desire to drink Mm -hmm. because you're happy, Mm -hmm. you know? So it's like, you've got to get to the underlying causes. And within that, I think once, at least I can only speak for myself, but, you know, giving references is like, once you have that foundation and you're living with self-honesty, you have some degree of humility, uh, you have a willingness to grow and to learn, you've made restitution to people that you've hurt, you're dealing with your character defects, your anger, your fears, your identifying ego, your um, learning how to disassociate from negative self-talk. You know, mm-hmm. these are all things that are inherent in the 12 steps, meditation mm-hmm. and prayer, um, surrender, community. yeah, That's acceptance, huge. community, yeah. unconditional love, being of service to people, like making your life about other mm-hmm. instead of about you, which is what the narcissistic addict 
does. I mean, mm-hmm. you have to be that way. Mm-hmm. If you're dope sick, you can <laughs> I'm not going to go work at the goddamn homeless shelter. Like I need $20 right now yeah. and a ride downtown. I feel you like know? since you've used there's inflation, is it still just $20? I don't know. <laughs> I don't I mean you back in my day you could get well you're like, for, for $20. Five cents. It wouldn't you're last. Not yeah. It wouldn't last long, but you could get well for $20. Okay. Actually, you know what? It this, probably is. At this one car wash on Hoover in Washington, you used to be able to get $8 balloons Wow. Yeah. That was the special. Yeah, and those like would the they get you well for an hour or two, you know. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, I did Digress. But beyond, you know, just the foundation of a 12 step group, whatever, you know, fits your poison, so to speak. I mean, then there's so much to do in terms of your spiritual growth. And even within um, Alcoholics Anonymous, I mean, it's right there in the book called Alcoholics Anonymous. We highly encourage you to go seek outside help. Yeah. You know, so I mean, I've went to a place called Onsite in um, Nashville that's like a, you know, whole like childhood trauma, work through all that shit. I've done the Hoffman process. Mm -hmm. I've gone to Tony Robbins. Mm -hmm. I've gone to India on Mm -hmm. 21-day silent retreats. I've done Kundalini yoga for coming up on eight years now, Uh, Vedic meditation for about that long. Mm -hmm. So anything and everything to me that I can use to unravel trauma and get that out of my way, And then to deepen my relationship with God, mm-hmm. whatever God is. I, mean, yeah, I, yeah. I hesitate to use that word. It really freaks people out, but I'm becoming less apologetic. It's just like, I don't know. To me, I, on on one hand, it's like if someone's that freaked out about God, yeah. you haven't hit bottom. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, go, <laughs> yeah. spend, you know, go rack up more debt, go cheat on your wife ego. more, go yeah, yeah, do yeah. more crack, whatever, you know, it's yeah. like. To hit a body, you got to get to the point where the word God doesn't bother you. Yeah, I yeah. believe, honestly. And in the beginning, you know, funny of AA, I've studied a lot of AA history just because to me, it's again, we don't see it now because it's just it's embedded in our culture. But in a thousand years from now, in the annals of history, we'll look back on 1939 and you'll see this huge spike. Oh, of yeah. The entire self help movement was launched oh, yeah. by Alcoholics Anonymous. It's just an absolute phenomenon in terms of human behavior. Mm-hmm. And um, in the history of AA, it's really funny because when they would go, the first two guys that founded it, you know, they both got sober by just talking to each other and they were able to help one another because they understood what other people outside couldn't. You know, mm-hmm. your local pastor is not an alcoholic, like they don't get it. So you can't listen to them. Mm-hmm. Your wife might love you, but she's just nagging at you. She doesn't understand that you really need that drink. And mm-hmm. when you got those two guys together, like, hey, this is how I feel. And he opens his heart and said, man, this is how I feel too. Let's help each other. Once they discovered that and they were both struck sober, they went out to mental hospitals mm. and started to kind of like try and convert alkies, you mm-hmm. know? I mean, because back in the day when AA started, it was very low bottom cases. Mm-hmm. It wasn't like now where, you know, you have a couple of rough weekends. Oh, I had too many glasses of wine. I'm going to mm-hmm. go to AA. I yeah, mean, yeah. back then you're on the street, you've yeah, lost yeah, yeah, everything, yeah, yeah, you know? Yeah. Like, bums, like literally like bums, you know? So they'd go around to these churches and they would interview the guy in the mental hospital when he would come to from the delirium tremens and all that. And uh, they'd say, you know, okay, so you're, you know, you got a drinking problem. Yeah. And they go, well, are you ready to surrender your life to God? And if the guy was like, no, they go, well, good luck. Bye. Mm -hmm. I mean, you had to surrender on the spot. They'd they'd want to hold hands and pray and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. It was was not religious, but it was very like spiritual. Yeah. And not, not esoteric. I mean, it's like, no, God's the only thing that can save you. Do you want that? Yes. Okay, cool. Let's do it. And then it would work. So it's um it's interesting in that in that perspective. So I think you do have to hit a bottom and you have these deeper levels of surrender, but within that, you know, there is the negative side of like sitting in AA meetings for 35 years, mm-hmm. not doing any other work and just having your ego build an identity around like I'm an old timer in the meeting, yeah. I sponsor 15 people and I still hate my life, mm-hmm. you know, which is like that dry drunk thing. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the pitfalls that I think is um wise to look out for and that's why Delving into some of the other um, approaches to spirituality and stuff will help uh, will help one um, avoid Expand, the risk of being concretized, yeah. you know? Because yeah. that happens sometimes. You start to build an ego identity around being a sober person yes. and the milestone of whatever year you've hit. And at one point, I kind of just had to let go of all that. Even recently, sometimes I'm like, well, I say to someone, well, I'm 22 years sober. And mm-hmm. I'm like... Maybe I don't even have to say that. Maybe that's not even a thing anymore. It's just you know another I mean? form of ego in a you way. Know what I, mean? I love it's what not you're even, saying. It's not, not even like I'm bragging about it. No. I just I still identify as a sober man, and it's like and as a separate in a way. It might not even yeah. be necessary to have that identification. Totally, it might just be like, hey, we have a dinner party, and you offer me some wine. I'm like, oh no, thanks. Yeah, like that might be the story. Totally. 
Yeah. You know, it's not like, well, no, I haven't had one of those in 22 years. My friend Ashley Neese wrote a really excellent piece on her blog for anybody who uh, is looking for a resource of exactly what you're saying. And I think I'm going to paraphrase the title a little bit or chop it up, but why I don't identify as Alcoholics Anonymous anymore, why mm. I'm just why I'm just sober or why I just don't drink or something like that. And it was a really beautiful piece of exactly what you're talking about. My whole intention this year has just been getting hyper mindful as, as much as I can in the present. And, you know, and I love what you're saying, and this isn't to go against somebody who's identifying, but I think I'm really starting to get so interested in not identifying as any, I'm one for, I'm an Aquarius, so I'm one for like no labels in general. So I'm starting to take that so much deeper, but I love what you're saying is, the more that we disidentify as anything in a way is the more we become a collective and oneness and all of that. And so I just yeah. love that you're saying, be careful of that, yeah. that particular pitfall that you can't go into. And, and, you know, there are many avenues you can take to deepen your spirituality while in that program. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of ways in which you can get stuck yeah. in, in recovery because um, the ego likes safety. And so it'll build these sort of constructs and you'll arrive at a certain place of understanding or development, and the ego will say, mm, let's pour concrete on this. <laughs> let's yeah. stay here. Yeah. Danger lurks on the other side of another awakening, so let's stay here. And for some of us, like myself, that stuckness gets so uncomfortable that like, oh, i got to have another breakthrough, and you keep pushing through and pushing through. And my ultimate goal as an entity here is just absolute merging with God and enlightenment. So mm. I'm not going to get stuck in like, oh, credit cards. You know, it's yeah, like, yeah, no, yeah, it's yeah, like yeah, yeah. no, 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 yeah. no. We're going, we got to go way beyond, yes. you know, where I, where I want to go in terms of evolution. Yeah. Uh, but another thing I want to touch on too, which I think would be useful for mm-hmm. people is you have the spiritual framework, right? Which allows you whatever your um, chosen modality is, let's just say something like Vedic meditation, mm-hmm. right? Or any kind of meditation that's really effective where you have a technique that's not just like... I'm sitting here letting go of my thoughts, focusing on my breath. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, any kind of mindfulness meditation where I think when Eckhart Tolle's first book, The Power of Now, came out, mm-hmm. that was a, also a huge pivotal moment for me in my recovery because it was very much in alignment with with the 12 steps. The 12 steps treat alcoholism as a mental illness. Mm -hmm. And the problem is not the alcohol. The problem is that you have an insane mind that tells you that either, fuck it, life's not worth it, I'm going to drink, or it tells you, you know what, I could probably just have one drink this Mm -hmm. time. But it's it's a mental illness, it really is. Yeah. It's the that well, negative self-talk. Even on a scientific level, that. like how your neural your neural pathways start to convert in terms of survival, it becomes like an obsession in the loop. I mean, absolutely, yeah. your yeah. brain changes totally. And that's you know, in that book that I reference, Alcoholics Anonymous, one of the things that was a huge turning point for me, and then sort of developed into the Eckhart Tolle approach. I still want to say Eckhart Tolle because I did too. <laughs> when he first came out, that's how everyone said it. <laughs> I know. But now like people say it right, so I feel like I have to conform to yeah. Toll the right way. Um, it looks like Tolle on paper. Yeah. But uh, in that book, it says that glass in hand, we warped our minds. Mm-hmm. Actually, no, that's in the, in the 12. Uh, the 12 and 12 is another book they call it. But yeah, we warped our minds. And I remember reading that and someone pointed out to me like, Luke, you have a warped mind. Mm-hmm. You get a parking ticket and you think about it for fucking five days and that's all you can think about. Mm-hmm is how you're going to get back at them and, Mm -hmm. you know, whatever. I mean, just insanity. And that's a minor example, but I would just spin out into all this negativity and self-talking and just, uh, it's an obsession of really what alcoholism is or addiction. It's an obsession of the mind in a very global sense. It's just... It, if you're drinking, it's on like another whiskey. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you're a sex addict, it's on another prostitute or pornography or whatever. Mm-hmm. But once you stop the behavior, you still have the obsession of the mind. Yes. It's just going to choose. Like for me, when I got sober, it was like spending money. Mm-hmm. I would go. We had this store called Circuit City back in the day. You know, in the prehistoric <laughs> I remember times. Circuit City. Yeah, my first credit cards. I was just like, I need to buy five VCRs, <laughs> and I would just go like run up my credit cards and just get high on the shopping. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's like God, it's so I'm so pathetic, and I was so desperate just to change the way that I felt. Yeah. Because my mind was creating a world and a reality for me that was so uncomfortable. Yeah. So once you get past the point of using exogenous sources to change your reality, then, well, I don't like to preach, but it behooves me to find ways within myself through my spirituality to change my perception of life. Absolutely. You know, it's like right before I got sober, it's, I mean, it's a great story. It's probably too late to digress and tell it now. But one of the things that led up to me hitting bottom was I was at a party and I was drunk, shocker. Um, and my friend had a Rottweiler. He was my pot dealer. And um, 
I was fucking wasted and I was like slapping the Rottweiler kind of on its hind quarters, you know, mm-hmm. like you do. And the Rottweiler was like, really? Fuck you. Boom. And he wow. bit me on the face. Wow. Yeah. I have scars right here still. And, uh, and that led to, you know, I had to go to the emergency room and then, you know, there was a lawsuit and I got all this money and then I spent all that money on heroin. Mm-hmm. And there was all these things that happened that were, you know, quote unquote negative or positive. And it's funny now because it's like every little thing that happens in my life now is really viewed as a positive. Oh, yeah. You know, and yeah. and, and that, see, I used to have to do drugs to change my version of reality. I got the parking ticket. Oh, I got the divorce. I Someone died, someone's ill, whatever. Okay, I'm going to ingest something, whether it's, you know, something that gets you high or... Um, you know, the high of spending money, you know, whatever it is, whatever your high is, right? And so I have to use that to change my perception of reality. But through practices like meditation, kundalini yoga, I can actually learn how to observe my thoughts Mm -hmm. via the power of now, you know, getting that framework where there's a me, which is my higher self, my soul, who I really am, that's embodying this 48-year-old male sexed meat suit. Mm -hmm. And I get to watch my personality right now as Mm -hmm. we speak. I get to watch my thoughts, watch my ego. There's a separation, you know, there's a witness experience mm-hmm. that starts to happen and there's a little crack in the in the armor there, you know, and some light shines through and you say like, oh shit, there's a me and then there's a thought. There's a me and that's watching the thought. Well, who's the one watching the thought? Mm-hmm. You know, and that's where you start to really play with the malleable reality that reality really is shaped by my perception of it. Completely. So how can I now find practices, teachers, et cetera, that really build the skill of within myself and my own awareness, changing my perception of reality, not into a false reality, but actually to be in alignment with actual reality. Completely. And actual, as present as possible. Yeah, and actual yeah. reality is, thank God that Rottweiler bit me on the totally. face. Totally. That was the best thing that ever happened totally. to me. Totally. I mean, really, that, that was one of the peak moments of my life. Mm-hmm. You know, it was traumatic. It hurt. It was scary. But it was necessary. Totally you know? necessary. And it's like you could ask a hundred people, hey, Luke got bit on the face by a Rottweiler, good or bad, you have to judge it, you have to label it bad, bad, bad all the way down mm-hmm. the line. But if you know the whole story and the arc of the story and what that led to, you would have to say, if not neutral, that it was positive. Mm-hmm. Thank you, know? you for so, sharing that. Yeah, so there's, it's learning how to gain control of your mind so you don't have to use drugs or other medications, whatever they might be, whatever. to there's do it for slew, you. Yeah. And that's really what it is. And there's so many resources available. Um, aside from the metaphysical realm, something that, you know, you know, I'm really into the health and yes. the biohacking yeah. and stuff. Well, also sharing because, you know, you have had the luxury and not, it wasn't a luxury at the time because you've obviously paid for it, like the Hoffman Institute's $4,000 mm-hmm. and like being able to fly to Tennessee and do these other things. But yeah. for the person who maybe doesn't have that accessibility right now, because you have so many resources on your site and links we can go to, as well as I know Kundalini is accessible at least through Rama TV online, totally. fourteen ninety nine a month if somebody's wanting to practice. I personally practice Kundalini as well yeah. or for the person who's interested in Vedic it's a one time training and then you have yeah. that mantra and you can do it what are the others you were going to mention well yeah which the, I do practice yeah, I've been practicing the, that I want to give a shout out to my teacher Jeff Kober who's a yeah. Vedic meditation teacher and also sober yeah, yeah yeah and a great actor you know people like I turn uh, I turn him on to people and they're like I saw that dude on the walking dead <laughs> I was like yeah yeah he's cool he's a cool guy but yeah he does something interesting with the Vedic he just charges a flat fee of a thousand dollars now oh great because in the Vedic tradition it's like it's always been on a sliding scale and like you have to give a week's pay which for some people a week's pay is a hundred thousand dollars yeah 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 some people it's a hundred dollars you know it's just yeah. I always thought that was kind of weird it's like that TM like TM is kind of weird in that way with the yeah. payments and Fine. stuff Financially, I think it turns got a lot me of a little, Got me a little funky. And anyway, I talked to Jeff a few months ago. I was like, what does it cost? And he was like, you know what? I got tired of all that shit. It's $1,000 for everyone, whatever. Awesome. You know? And that's four days of training. So Yeah. And it's a lifetime of a practice, truthfully. Oh, I, there's yeah. no... Dude... You could you could pull up an armored car right now and go, yeah. Luke, here's a billion dollars mm-hmm. cash. We're going to give it to you right now, but we're going to remove your capacity to meditate for the rest of your life. There's no way I would take it. Yeah. There's nothing that I value. Well, there's things I value more than meditation, but it's something that I could never live without. Yeah, I love know? it just as much. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so other resources. Well, what I wanted to really talk about was now that I know so much about health and about hormones and neurotransmitters and circadian rhythm and all these things, you know, you're a fan Absolutely. of Jack Cruz like me. 
now when I meet anyone that's sober and they're still suffering from depression or anxiety or they're on meds, they have insomnia, really what's going on with most people is they're low dopamine. To- and what, yeah, and, what, and just that's an epidemic in society. Oh my God, in yeah. We're going to, again, we're going to look back on this time period of all these devices that we're all addicted to, oh. the blue light that's coming off your iPhone, your iPad, your computer, the flicker rate of all the LED lights Completely. that's brainwashing us and damaging our eyes and our brains. So. And if all someone, the lights in the street. I mean, it's all of everywhere. It. Yeah. So if someone is like, yeah, I don't have five grand for the Hoffman process or whatever, what do I do right now? And this sounds, I have such a hard time getting people to do this shit because it's because it's free mm-hmm. and because it's relatively easy, they won't do it. Yeah, yeah. It's no, so it's simple. true. Yeah. If you get up every morning yeah. and watch the sunrise for the first 20 minutes and look at that red light. And, and if the you're sun. naked on top of it. Yeah, yeah. And grounded. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, and grounded, the earth. Yeah. Yeah, but on the really, earth. I honestly, again, like looking at the, the big picture of where we are in terms of a species right now, we are zoo animals. Oh, completely. And we are domesticated in these homes where we're cut off from natural light. We're cut off from the elements that are hot yeah. and cold. Our nervous systems are so fucking weak. Oh, man. Emotionally, we're so fucking weak. Like with... Especially the generation that's in the room looking at us. Yeah. No offense. It's like I've hired like millennials, and I'll just I say like a word, and they're like, ah. No, these guys are great. They're like love avoidant. They're tough. They're tough. Oh, okay. These are tough chicks. Want to hear, want to hear a funny story? So yeah. I had um I had an employee working for my fashion school, and I have an Amazon Prime account. <laughs> so I was thinking about this a couple of days ago because I was using one, but um. She had gone in, you know, I said, we need to order extension cords or whatever, computer hard drive or something like that. So I gave her the login for R, which is my Amazon account. And um, there were, I had ordered some condoms mm-hmm. online, which is like, yeah, I'm a fucking adult, like yeah, yeah. whatever, you yeah, know. Yeah. Uh, it's not like I'm ordering sex Oh, toys no, you guys must see, I, re- I order the weirdest <laughs> shit all the time, Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, because so, Lila gets the notifications <laughs> totally. Yeah. So I, I didn't know, but a few months later, after that person no longer worked for us, my partner, Lauren, was like, oh, yeah, dude, like she got totally freaked out when she logged into Amazon. She was like having a fucking panic attack, got mm. all weirded out because she saw that you had ordered condoms. I'm like, dude, we are too fragile. Yeah. Like, honestly, this is a problem. It's such a double coin, too, because it's like so responsible. And there's just so many. I mean, it's such a conversation. I mean, as a society in general right now, everything that's happening, even with like call out culture and stuff, which there, there is such a need for transition and change a hundred percent but more than anything and i think that's what you're going to pivot into we need to fucking strengthen our subconscious and nervous system and stop making it about the outside world and start to empower ourselves individually it's a it's a victim um, mentality you know and that that's not to say that there aren't victims no absolutely every everyone's a victim and i'm all for empowerment but self-empowerment is the number one empowerment that's where you get your power damn it that's where you see and if you don't have that then you're going to go around trying to solve all the problems in the world without yeah projecting very effective yeah Yeah. a thousand percent where I was really going was really in alignment with nature. You know? oh, okay. And this has, well, no, no, it, <laughs> it's and true. it's all part of it. It has to do with your emotional resilience because it has to do with your nervous system. And that's one thing that's great about Kundalini Yoga. It really fortifies your nervous system. So when the flight gets canceled, the person breaks up with you, the whatever ad infinitum, that you have the resiliency to go, like, okay, wow. Taken aback for a moment, but here I am, I'm back because you have your breath. Absolutely. And if you can use things like sun gazing, grounding, cold thermogenesis, aka ice baths, infrared saunas, getting out in nature, staying connected. That's what really builds your nervous system because that's what gives you voltage. Totally. You know, and what's happened is we're just completely domesticated now. We're living in artificial light and all of these um, EMFs from the Wi-Fi and the cell towers. And I mean, it's just like, we're not living in a natural environment. And so mm-hmm. um, that has a lot to do with how, especially the sun and our relationship to natural light, not just sun gazing, but even just being outdoors in the more. the sun, yeah. yeah and this crew knows about it because I talk about it so yeah, much. Yeah, I mean, yeah. like right now we're sitting in here and it's the afternoon and there's daylight coming in. So and we it, have blue light hitting us. Yeah, but if, yeah. I, if I asked you, I was like, hey, are, are we getting natural light today? You know, mm-hmm. someone would be like, well, yeah, look, there's a no. window right there but see yeah. windows cut out half of the uv spectrum yeah, so we're actually be right yeah so yeah. we're actually getting a diffused fake light because think about it in nature glass doesn't exist totally you Absolutely. know and so if you think about um our relationship to light and the sun and the planets especially people that listen to your show they might be aligned um you know with astrology and understanding yeah. where we fit in the universe and the solar system 
our bodies are literally solar panels Mm -hmm. and they're computerized electrified solar panels. And that part of us is what controls our mood, our neurotransmitters, our hormones, our impulses, our ability to be happy, our ability to love and to be loved. To absorb nutrients. Yeah, all of that. Basic, yeah. All of that. And so that's the thing I get, you know, because I slang supplements on my um, my website. And I mean, there's $12,000 devices you can get that I have that are awesome and I love all that stuff. But for people like, yeah, but I don't, you know, where do I start? It's too confusing or too expensive. I'm like... If you just get in the sun and you get in ice baths, eat a couple oysters. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, some fish. Get some DHA. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's like your life will. Ch- and if you stop blue light at night, which yeah. is a commitment, people have a hard time with that. You have to adjust your devices. You yeah. got to change all the lighting in your house. Or you can just be like us here, poor Max. I just we have blackout shades and it goes candlelight at dusk. Yeah, <laughs> that's I mean, it. He has an that's the best. Room. I mean, that's the best. Yeah. And you know, if it, see what sucks is we're so um, habituated mm-hmm. to the domestication zoo animal life that we live it's like when I was just on this trip with my lovely um, lady friend you know she put up with me but I, I we checked in the Airbnb and I was like cool okay I got out all my light bulbs yeah. I, I packed like amber yeah, yeah amber yeah. light bulbs and I changed all the light bulbs and she's like really dude we don't know each other that well yet <laughs> yeah, you yeah, know you're crazy. Um, yeah. yeah and I'm like listen you're dedicated this, two million years of evolution yeah and I'm not going backwards. Yeah, yeah, if we have to shoot something cool, turn on the blue lights, whatever, I'll live. But it's like... It's a choice, yeah. Yeah, we've... Yeah. It's not insane to change the light bulbs in your house. It's mm-hmm. insane to fucking look at blue light in All a day. spectrum that doesn't... Sitting down. And it doesn't even exist in nature. It doesn't. You know, those lights yeah. we're looking at right now and the lights on our phones, that's not what the sun is. It's the a full sun, spectrum. Yeah, and yeah. so... Um, I do want to do a mini plug for anybody listening because it's yeah, about yeah. to launch. But each of the retreat houses, I will say like confidently, that's why you have to come and host something at one of them. But the one in Yosemite, especially, there's zero light pollution. It has a creek. There's natural water nearby where you can plunge. I it's was all obsessing on your stories last night. <laughs> <laughs> we have a infrared sauna there, a biomat there. I mean, it's going to be literally this, how to get you back fully to nature. And then you get complete access to all of the workshops. That's so beautiful that you're doing that. You're like... You're you're a step ahead of me on that dream. I'd love to. Oh, do you're going to come like on in. Too. Yeah. yeah. So I'm quickly interrupting this episode to invite you if you're ready to start your manifestation journey or if anything you've heard in our manifestation episodes has piqued your interest to begin. We have a la carte workshops. In everything from the basics bundle, which is what we recommend to everyone who starts. It's the formula that actually teaches you how to manifest, unblocked inner child, and unblocked shadow. We also have a la carte workshops on love and money. But the real gem is the Pathway membership because it encompasses every single workshop we have. It's a year-long membership with full access to the few a la carte offerings we have and exclusive workshops not available anywhere else, such as the daily practice, which is what everybody in the pathway uses, hopefully at least three times a week to daily in order to truly create the new neural pathways that one needs in order to manifest and houses the library of our deep imaginings, which is our unique hypnosis process that allows you to get into your subconscious and overwrite those old neural pathways creating the new ones. You can use our special code EXPANDED, all caps, E-X-P-A-N-D-E-D, to receive $20 off your first a la carte workshop purchase or $20 off your first month of the pathway. Again, that's all caps, EXPANDED, E-X-P-A-N-D-E-D. Okay, now back to the episode. You know, I've, I guess you could say coached or mentored a lot of guys, you know, that um, are in recovery and things like that. And, you know, there's the spiritual realm and there's the the metaphysical realm and all of that. But once I get them doing cryotherapy, ice baths, sun gazing, grounding, they get off meds, they start sleeping, they don't have anxiety anymore, they don't have depression. Yeah. 
they just lose all these issues. They start to balance. Oh, yeah. it's fucking crazy. Yeah, if someone comes to me and they're like, dude, I'm on meds and I'm, you know, it's ruining my life. What do I do? I'm like, well, I'm not a doctor. Don't stop taking your meds. Keep yeah. working with your doctor and tell them you want to wean off. But if yeah. you start doing the natural protocols and get in that environment. You'll be supported enough. To yeah, and then all of a sudden they're just like, yeah, that just went away. That's not a thing anymore. Totally. You know, and I'm not recommending someone go off no, their meds. No, 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 no. I yeah. would never be that I've actually seen people do that and it's really, really interesting. Oh, yeah, I've, yeah, I was on psych meds um, in early sobriety and I was a fucking, oh my God, I was a train wreck and I tried to stop them and I got really crazy. I have to segue into one other thing too. When Eckhart told, I think this is actually a really interesting thing to note for people because of wherever we might be at. But the first time I attempted to read that when I was, it was in 2008 and I was um, like working as a waitress at the Laugh Factory, so poor, the lowest self-worth on the planet at that point. I remember being in my bath in my East Hollywood like studio apartment with cockroaches that lived with me and trying to attempt to read that. I was actually talking to my friend about this the other day and I was like, is this in another language? Like, I, My consciousness was not at all able to comprehend like what, how, huh? You know, like this is crazy to me and I also kind of don't even understand what's being said. And then I just revisited it over the holidays and continue because that's sort of my whole intention this year and I'm like oh this is so easy not easy granted I, it's I a practice I know exactly what you're talking about this, and I will have to credit that to Kundalini yeah. and Vedic meditation and all of these things that we do I've had that experience too there was a book that was gifted to me before I was sober it's a really thick book it's called I Am That by um, Nisargadatta Maharaj wow. and it's deep non-duality mm. Eastern mysticism kind yeah, yeah. of stuff, Indian. And I remember I would read the back cover. <laughs> yeah. Alone. The, yeah, the back cover. And I would just be like, ah, there's something <laughs> in it. I was like, this is the shit. I don't get it. Yeah. It was something about like, okay, say there's a building. I have, I mean, I have the book. I think I read that part on my very first podcast, Return of the Jedi, number one. Um, but it's like, say there's a building and then... You know, the ages come and the storms come and the building is gone. Would you say the space is still there? So is the building really there? You know, one of those kind of things. And I was like, whoa. Like if the tree falls to anybody. Yeah, exactly. That kind of thing. And I'd be super high, just going like, whoa. (laughs) But then I would open the book and I'd be like, "Uh, I don't understand anything. There's something here. And I knew there was. Fast forward 15 years, maybe, of picking up that book again and going like, oh, duh. Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. So I just want to take that note too for anybody yeah. listening. Like, and this doesn't have to be, you know, an investment of so much time until you can kind of hit these spaces. The information that Luke's giving you here and now, where you might be at in your life, it doesn't have to be, you know, like you're in recovery. It can be anywhere where you're just sitting and you're like, what do I do to kind of get a hold on reality in a way and also presence and then also health to match so that we can be happy yeah. <laughs> and present yeah. and accept things and surrender, you know, the simplicity of just starting exactly those free things you were talking about, your meditation practice, whatever it might be, these things open up our consciousness to be able to go to these next levels. And I think that, I mean, obviously anybody who's doing Unblocked, you're really addressing childhood and all sorts of stuff that I think that it's anything that's going to help you feel homeostasis and worthy. That's it. That's the answer in many ways. Totally. And that's that's basically what you're telling people. There mm-hmm. are r- very accessible places to go yeah. with this. You know, another thing too worth mentioning, and your, your um, guided meditations are awesome for oh, this too, by you. the way. Yeah, I was just actually talking to... Um, uh, Rihanna that I was mentioning earlier, and she's she does your course too. Oh, by she the way, does. yeah, yeah, I'm she so she happy. loves it. Yeah, and she was she's like, oh, I just listened to one of Lacey's meditations. I'm like, I know those things are deep. Oh, dude. I'm so happy. Yeah. Also, I have to make, let's give a shout out to her because I just saw your picture in Santa Fe, and I was like, what's that weave that you're wearing? And then I clicked and I saw her work, and I was like, oh my god, yeah. I need those crop. That ghost this, dancer, amazing. At ghost amazing dancer, artist, yeah. incredible weaver. Yeah, so go Instagram, check her out. Instagram is um, the ghost dancer. Yeah. At the the amazing answer. artist yeah okay. but yeah we were talking about your um your program and i'm like yeah i'm i'm super into the theta vibe like that <laughs> float tanks are like my favorite thing ever yeah my fiance is too i can't stand them oh really but he loves them yeah so any kind of like binaural beads or float tanks or when i do neuro neurofeedback by oh, the way is so expensive powerful. but for anyone suffering from ptsd trauma neurofeedback is really really and effective. emdr is another plug yeah i haven't is. done that yet i want to try that um 
But anywho, I love those things that just kind of really take you into that space. So for someone who's challenged by meditation, you know, listening to guided ones is a, is a really good place to start. I agree. And to help you like get lift off until you can just kind of do it on your own. But I have to say for me, it's something that's been really profound and continues to be in terms of just reprogramming my whole psyche is listening to audio. So Mm -hmm. I got the power of now on CD back in the day and I would listen to Wayne Dyer and Stuart Wilde. And a lot of this you can find for free on YouTube. Yeah, Yeah. totally. Yeah. And even, even podcasts like the Ram Dass podcast is insane. I mean, I've listened to every single episode. Don't listen while driving, man, to any of them. You're like, many of them (laughs) over and over again. (laughs) So relaxing. There's a lot to be, I mean, you can really learn a lot from audio. Audio, so good. And it's something, you know, like this podcast here that you can do while you're engaged in something else, but it still sinks in. So that was a huge part of my reprogramming too. It was not only Amazing. reading and reading um, in a compliment, uh, like a um, contemplative, studious way, if mm-hmm. that's a word. Like just, I mean, when I would read spiritual text, it's like I'm reading it one word at a time mm-hmm. going over maybe one sentence mm-hmm. 20 times. To absorb, yeah. Yeah, I mean like not, oh yeah, I read that book. No, like I'm going to read a book for the next 10 years. Like um, Emmett Fox, uh, Sermon on the Mount. Completely. I read that book almost every day for 15 years. And it's a short book. Yeah. You know, there's yeah, not that yeah. much to it. Yeah. But it's just, I would find these nuggets, you know, like one of his principles is about um, enemy soldiers, that negative thoughts are like enemy soldiers. And if you let them dig and entrench into the field, they're really hard to to get to. Yeah. Uh, but if you can pick them off as they present themselves, you know, you can win the war, something to that effect. But it was a great it's metaphor. Great. And so, yeah. And then that just integrates into my mind. You know, I wake up and like I spill the smoothie in the kitchen and I'm like, oh, see, uh, so annoying. I hate life. Uh. And I'm like, enemy soldier. Yeah. <laughs> That's the first one. There he comes over the ridge. Yeah, He's trying yeah. to dig his foxhole. Yeah. And I'm like, fuck you, enemy soldier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got I'm this. not going there. I'm yeah. like, wow, what a great moment to like play with this green dye on my floor, this spirulina. Wow, it's really beautiful. You know, let's make some <laughs> art. It's like, Yes. But yeah, I would just say, man, for, you know, for people getting down with like the really enlightening audio is huge too. Yeah, I agree. Absolutely. Yeah. I listen to a ton of it myself driving still all the time. Yeah. Not still like I've arrived anywhere. Yeah. I'm such <laughs> a work in process. No, of yeah, course. Yeah, yeah. Of course. But it, you know, there's tools that are useful for a time and then you kind of let them go. And then yeah. there's tools that kind of just remain. And for me, the audio has been that way. And I guess so probably digestible. one of the main reasons I started a podcast is I was like, wow. I'm listening to all these people. I could be sitting down and talking to them yeah. and sharing them with people that might not have discovered them. And I would also like to shout out my all-time favorite favorite spiritual teachers, um, a man named David R. Hawkins. Oh, the best, yeah. yeah. And they're oh, yeah. very familiar too, yeah. but continue with that. Yeah, and that was one that I found, I think the power of now, God, I probably found that, I don't know, was letting go your first? No, no. The power of... Oh, not the, yeah, I'm yeah. sorry, not the power of now. Power versus, versus force. force. Sorry, yeah. yeah. Power yeah. versus force. And that one I got. And the reason I, I liked it is because he was friends with Bill Wilson, who was oh. the co-founder of AA. And, oh, wow. Yeah. And David Hawkins was... When he died, he was sober like 55 years wow. or something. Yeah, yeah. And so he was there in the early days when Bill Wilson was doing LSD and all the Hawkins was a shrink and he was friends with Harry Tebow, who was um, Bill Wilson's shrink. And there was all this trippy... It's when the spirituality of the new thought movement in the mm-hmm. 30s merged with psychiatry. Mm-hmm. And there was this really Which interesting is magic thing. In yeah, there was this really interesting thing that happened. And David Hawkins was kind of at the forefront of that. And he was a psychiatrist in New York City for 50 years. Wow, I didn't treated, know that. Yeah, he's a fascinating guy. I used to go see him speak in Sedona. And he he treated thousands of alcoholics and he just he he had it down and then he went like way beyond the beyond yeah, with it yeah. but his other books including the last one letting go Ugh. um that one is probably the best entry point i'm glad you yeah. you talk about it with your people because it's so deep, but the way he wrote that one is so much um, more simple than his oh, other yeah. books. His other books, one of his books is called um, The Eye of the Eye, Real- I think Reality Versus Subjectivity. Mm, and that's like that book, dense. I Am That, where yeah. I got it and I'm like, oh, I'm like just one <laughs> word at a time. You know? My brain's melting. It took me yeah. two years to read that book, wow. and I read it almost every day because I just, I'm like, I don't, want, I don't want to read it. So, oh yeah, I read that book. I want to read it so I can internalize yeah. it. And then now I go back and I'm like, oh yeah, I totally get that. Is that funny? You know? Yeah, it's amazing. Expands. But but there's a lot of audio you can get of David Hawkins too, and oh, he's that's just great. had a really amazing framework for the human experience using his scale of consciousness. You know, from the animal kingdom going up into the angelic realms, and so it gives you kind of um, a marker of where you might be. 
which affects, of course, all of your relationships and finance and mental health and emotional health. And it gives you something to sort of strive for that I want to get to the upper levels. And so you'll be aligned at different times in your life with different teachings that calibrate at a different level Mm -hmm. that might be appropriate. That's why, you know, the 12 steps are a great entry point because they're based on the principle of unconditional love. Mm -hmm. That's what the 12 steps are. It's like, Mm -hmm. come here, man, we'll love you, you freak. Coming off the street, you know what I mean? Which is the principle of like being present. It's kind of the foundational principle of a lot of things. Right. And then once that's in lock, kind of what we're talking about later, then, oh, wow, let me, you know, study some teachings of the Maharishi or do the meditation and that. And then there's higher realms that wouldn't be accessible to the kid who's like 22 and just getting off crystal meth. He's like, what, Maha who? Yeah. (laughs) You're going to fucking meditate? (laughs) Yeah. But I'll go to a meeting every day and smoke yeah. cigarettes yeah you know totally so i love hawkins because he gives you a really wide spectrum of of experience and it also he's so great at um was he died but he's so great at giving an explanation as to why there are these dark forces and mm. evil energies in the universe and that it's all god yeah you know it's not like oh god is is over here in the light the and polarity then, yeah exactly yeah. that you know it's like it's like Yogi Bhajan said, if you don't see God in all, you don't see God at all. I believe that, it. That's just called shadow work, man. And back yeah, to what we were talking yeah. about before in fragility and just nothing outside of you matters in a way. It's everything inside of you. That's true shadow integration, you know, that it's not that. That's actually me and I'm that and we're together and we're totally connected. It's that It's that true integration of shadow. So yeah, and that. to have compassion for shadow too. You know, That's the huge, it's, yeah. It's so easy to look at you know the world stage of politics and social issues, and yeah. even going back in history and thinking, oh, they're bad. You know, now we have this political climate, like where it's like, I hate those people that hate people. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, know? I, know, like, I know, I know, I'm like, I know. But this more of the same, yeah. you know. So he had Hawkins had a really great way of just explaining the different calibrations of consciousness, yeah. and that there's different humans or uh, different points on the scale, and that. They're all innocent. Yeah. Even the ones on the lower yeah. scale. Because and that they, we all go through them. Yeah, and they believe they're doing the right thing. Totally. And the most evil human you can imagine, in the moment of their evil, they believe they're doing good. And they just, yeah, exactly. Not, it doesn't make what they're doing good it or acceptable. It does okay. Yeah. yeah. But, it's, but you yeah. can have compassion for their suffering because they're coming out of their own pain Absolutely. and their pain's being inflicted on others. Not to say that they shouldn't be stopped, not that you should condone you know, anything that harms anyone else, of course, but I don't know. I find that having like, again, a more zoomed out worldview makes me take all the little nuances of our societal problems a little less seriously. Like, Absolutely. I don't feel as compelled to go save the world in that naive sense. It's more like, how can I bring light right now when I walk in Seven Eleven? Yep. Yeah, or on this podcast. Yeah, or on your yeah, podcast. You know, yeah, mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe you know yeah. the Seven Eleven would be a starting point. Yeah, yeah. But it, it's like that. <laughs> I mean, I just don't see you even going into Seven Eleven. Actually, I don't. I don't but know where I, that yeah, even I like came that. from. I like that metaphor. Wait, I have an even bigger question. Yeah, I fly to Ireland tomorrow, <laughs> or I'm flying to Paris then Ireland tomorrow, oh and I know God. that you're coming out with a course that I'm super stoked about. My nemesis. Travel. Uh, is it to to Europe? You hate that uh, flight. Just you know, I love. I would say like I love going to different oh, places, right. but I hate traveling. I heard this when you were talking to J- Dr. Jack Cruz on your podcast, which is a great episode. You have two of them. Yeah, another one. Him. I have another one with Jack Cruz coming out in a month or so. Right. Um, and you we were t- trying all the angles. You were like, but I plug my biomat in. He's like, yeah. it's still plugged in. You know, so I just tell us about with, your course that's coming out. Well, it's just selfishly because for the past 22 years that I've been exploring all these different alternative healing and health modalities and supplementation and practices and devices and now this thing they call biohacking, kind of like learning and understanding your own biology and dealing with that yourself rather than taking it to a doctor to fix it for you. Um, One of the things I have not been able to fully uh, fix, I guess you could say, is the negative effects of travel. Mm. When I fly specifically, and especially on really long flights, I just get completely wrecked. And so if I'm traveling for business, I'll have to buffer an extra day of recovery and like pay for a hotel, rental car, whatever, just because I can't fly in somewhere and be normal. Yeah. I'm just totally tweaked. Uh, going on a vacation with a loved one or family or something, it's like, again, have to book extra days in the beginning of the trip and once I get home to just recover. And so I've been working for many, many years at putting together 
really all of these different practices, which might include taking supplements or different devices, and then also just how to get in alignment with the circadian rhythm yeah. and to beat jet lag and things like that. So I finally just last year started documenting on video all of the wacky shit that I do yeah. when I travel. I mean, if you I can't see, wait to see if this. you see me get on an air, I wish I could bring a video crew on an airplane with me. And I like, bet it's just you watch must me look nuts. set up yeah. my JetBlue mint seat, you know, <laughs> with all my shit. And I, and I actually one of the hacks is like. Go on trips half as often and fly first class. Oh, like, yeah, honestly, I do. Like, yeah, I did business this one. I yeah. can't. And I'm not trying to be like highfalutin. I just like coach. You need to be able to sleep and Coach stuff is like a that. miserable experience. Yeah. You know, I know that's not accessible to everyone for a lot of my life. It wasn't no way. for yeah, me Yeah, I mean, either. are you kidding me? I was lucky to even get on a plane yeah. at all. It didn't like, put me in the fucking cargo department. You know? totally. <laughs> <laughs> like, even a seat in the back was too yeah. much for a long time. But no, that's, that's part of it. But I just have all these practices. And then finally I started just doing um, many bits of content about them because yeah. people would ask. They'd see me on the airplane doing an Insta Live or something of a supplement or this thing I'm plugging in. They're like, what is that? What is that? So I started making longer form videos and then Mm. eventually came up with like what's a couple hours worth of content just on every single possible thing you could apply. Amazing. From free ones like, you know, sun gazing, especially when you land in a different time zone. No matter how tired you, you have to get up, get your bare feet, hopefully on wet ground, not on a city street ideally because there's a lot of No, in Paris it's like the park. Yeah. Yeah. And um and looking at the sun. So there, you know, it's ice baths, there's saunas there's all that but there's also a lot of supplements and a lot of um a lot of different devices and things like that you can use and there's of course like a scale of you know uh, how much those things cost yeah, you know sure. some of them are free and some you have to spend money on but yeah so i just decided i've always wanted to do an online course and yeah. i didn't really i don't want to do something that someone's already done there's a lot of great information out there already and i thought well I don't think anyone's as obsessed with fixing travel as me yeah. because it fucks me up worse than anyone I know. Yeah, I fly to New York with my business partner, Lauren. We get off the plane. She's like, cool, I'm going to Barney's. Oh, I I'm know. Like, that's oh. how my partner is. I'm like, yeah. what? I know. I'm just <laughs> I'm like going you. to sleep for three days. Like, what are you talking about? Totally. I, I, like, I can't find the baggage claim. I'm all disoriented. I'm dizzy, irritable. I mean, I'm just a freaking wreck. And yes. so I'm like, God damn it, I'm fixing this. And I have systematically, like piece by piece by piece, made it better and better all the time. And so, oh, I cannot wait for this. Yeah, so I'm finally- yeah, tomorrow I'm like doing business class was the one. I'm going to like uh, drink eight ounces of my water with chlorella for as, every mm-hmm. hour I'm on the flight. I'm doing compression socks. Yeah, I'm doing yeah, like the fasting. I'm yeah. all the things. If I have sun in Paris, I'll do that. But The d- compression I'll... socks are good. I just wore those on my flight yesterday and I have a compression shirt oh, and EMF blocking clothes. Wow. So cool it's metal. Too. I have these wow. Faraday, these like slacks that are a Faraday cage. Okay. So they have this metal thread in them that prevent RF frequency. Wow, like, that's uh, probably what messes yeah. everyone up the most. It is. There's really high EMF. You know what? You know what really sucks. I learned from Jack Cruz actually yeah. is that um, he only flies on planes without Wi-Fi. He does. Yeah, and I'm like, duh, but I want the Wi-Fi. I don't use but, it. Yeah. yeah, he'll book flights just specifically um, so they don't have Wi-Fi. Wow. And also, I don't do this, but one of the best hacks is flying at night. Yeah, that's what I chose as well. Yeah, so have, I can do red glasses the mm-hmm, whole time. And less solar radiation. Oh, There's just yeah. less weird electrostatic in the atmosphere that's at right. night. But I just don't like, I just, it tweaks me too bad. Just like the sleep rhythm gets too weird. But yeah, um, but yeah the, I know. Com- the compression clothing is really good. And EM- I have an EMF blocking little beanie. Wow. You know, so See, we have so much to learn. This there's is a lot. Be yeah, there's a lot. Of, I mean, there's a lot of things that you can do now. Some people that get bothered by it less, they'll do less. They're yeah. like, cool, I'll just do the sun gazing thing yeah. to beat I'll the jet lag. Eat the thing or not eat the thing, like yeah. whatever I'm supposed to but do. But there's, there's a lot of cool stuff you can do to make it less brutal. Yeah. Okay, we'll share that in the show notes because cool. that's exciting. And yeah, anything else going on that we should check out? Uh, what else is going on right now? I don't have a date, but I do have an event at Rama in Venice coming up, cool. which is called the High Love Experience that I did uh, in October in New York, and it was a big hit. It was amazingly fun for me. I turned it into a podcast episode, so I'm going to complete that workshop again there. Okay. The same format, some Kundalini yoga and some inner work. It was pretty right. powerful. And then I'll have one coming up here in the next couple of months at Sacred Space in Miami too. Oh, great. Yeah. So I'll be doing in 2019. I, I want to definitely do some more workshops and, you know, because I do a lot of speaking where I drop in, you know, paleo effects or like these big conferences mm-hmm. and I go to a talk and that's fun because you can reach a lot of people. But I'm kind of, I like more intimacy. I'd yeah. rather take 
30 or 40 people and like we're going to have a goddamn experience. Deep. Yeah. Not just an, you know, a PowerPoint of like, oh, information. Here's how to be happy and healthy, but like let's do some stuff more experiential. So oh, that's I look exciting. To doing yeah. That. And, and when you're up and running, I want to come do Oh, you have I to. Do something at your it's space. going to be yeah. your haven. Yeah, you're this going to place love that, it. I'm telling you, last night I was like stalking your stores. I was like, oh my God, this place is a creek. Yeah. <laughs> so dope. And the river nearby. No, well, there's two. So like one's always running. It's a three. I know you'd find a spring right away, too. That's like right? the next mission is finding a right? spring. But there, but there it ha- the water's very sulfur rich. So there has to be some hot springs that are yeah. undiscovered. But yeah. so you have the Yosemite melt off May through like October they have a river that runs through that's a freshwater river and then there's one that's always running um, it's a three mile hike in the backyard it's insane oh, so you're going best. to be that's the love best it. it's so inspiring that's that's like my dream well yeah. I can't wait that's to awesome. have you there and yeah. we're so grateful you showed up today and came me and spoke too. with us oh and man me too I was excited to ask I, I like your show so it's cool to be on it too well I like yours Great. <laughs> so Great. go check out those episodes if you haven't listened to them go oh, check out yeah. every episode You're, the last one you did was really great too I mean it's it's funny when you and I'm sure you experienced this too but I don't think people quite grasp well, I don't, maybe they do but I, I get the sense not to the depth that I do but how much I'm actually learning and listening to people in an interview. Like yeah. when we did that one, it, for me, it's like I'm cheating and having a private session with you. And I'm just like, yeah, I'm going to call it a podcast. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> oh, yeah, it's for other people. But really, I'm like, all right, how do I fix this shit, Lacey? Yeah. And, and that one was really good. We had a couple of breakthroughs when I was looking at like um, my, um, what do they call blocks? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, around money and stuff. And I, I, discovered a couple of them, but even just in our conversation on that interview with you on my show, I forget which one it was. I think it was about like spirituality and money. Totally. Like That's if, huge If you're a sober people. person, you're supposed to stay humble and just yeah. be spiritual and you can't have... Be like, religious. It's, it's you know, thou shall not want. It's Yeah, free. and that was, that was one of the ones I was like, oh my God, I've been carrying that for a long time. So I'm yeah. glad. So I encourage people that... You know, obviously, are following your work to go check that out because you get to just really cut loose. And yeah, it was such a fun episode. Yeah, and I Cookie think we sat with me the whole time. That's true. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's true. Well, thank you so much today, Luke. For and sure. um, we'll definitely be linking that course because I have a speaking cool. tour this year. I need those hacks because it wrecks me just as much as you're talking really? about. Yeah, travel yeah. is so hard for me. So yeah, hard. some of us are more sensitive. You know, it's weird. Mm-hmm. Same thing with EMFs. You know, some people that doesn't seem to. I mean, I know it hurts everyone, but some yeah. like they're aware of. How how it bothers them, which is kind of me, and I think that's a lot of the the flying. But there's all kinds of crazy stuff you can do to help. Yeah, yeah. awesome. Yeah, well, yeah, thank yeah. you for sure. Thank you. Have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning into the episode, and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. We did. And in case you're not totally ready to join the pathway yet, I wanted to share a few of our free offerings that I'll often suggest to people as a little bit of a blueprint to get them started on their manifestation journey. The first place I like to direct people completely for free is the motivation. You can see it linked below or on our homepage as our testimony library. And it's categorized by different subjects, whether you're calling in career, money, love, wellness, and much more. When you're reading about a member's experience of what they manifested, you're actually seeing to believe and showing your subconscious that that very thing is possible for you. The second place I like to direct people is to the free clarity exercise, which is also linked below. In it, you get to try our own unique hypnosis process, learn about the science and some journaling prompts. And the best part about this You'll get a tiny taste of what it's like to go into your hypnotic state, bring your subconscious forward, and create new neural pathways while receiving clarity. And the third thing, if you haven't listened to it on this podcast yet, please go back to the episode titled Manifestation 101, where you'll learn the basics of neural manifestation to truly understand this process. So go ahead and check out those free resources, the motivation, the free clarity exercise, and the episode Manifestation 101, all linked below. And in an effort to make sure to have representation in this process series, go ahead and submit any process testimonials you have, especially to our LGBTQ plus community, our BIPOC, as well as the WISE, which is anyone in the community who is 45 and over. All right, we'll be back next week.